Good morning. Good morning. I want to echo uh, the comments that Gene uh, made about Memorial Day. You know, this is a. Uh, there are times like this in our calendar year when we are reminded of of things that are really a blessing to us. And to be able to gather like this this morning, we do each Sunday. And we have no fear of government interference. We have no fear, really, of persecution. And we have freedom to practice our faith outside of this building. And that is, uh, there are many around the world that don't have that today. And so we are privileged and we are grateful and thankful to those who sacrifice for that freedom. I also want to um, just mention something I know has been on your mind and heart this week, the, the tragedy uh, the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, um, is gut-wrenching. And, you know, things like this happen around our world. Um, evil, sin, suffering. And I remind you that God grieves. You know, we grieve in a way and we feel helpless. Like we, we, don't, we, we don't have control to stop and, and, and there's no way to back up and make right uh, certain wrongs that are done, and it's very hard on us. But I want to remind you that prayer is not the only thing you can do. It is by far the greatest and most effective thing you can do. Amen. When you stop and pray for tragedies, don't think that's a small thing. That is a great thing. And our Bible says a, a, a man's prayer, a, a righteous person, which is a Christian, a Christian's prayer is powerful and effective. And we need to remember that. We need to be praying more. We also had an article in the bulletin last week. Uh, so I'll just catch you up to date if you didn't know. But we have Christians in Ukraine that correspond with us and, and, uh, and Christians, of course, in America. And we uh, made a collection a few weeks ago and sent some funds. But Christians in Ukraine are sending word back that not only are they seeing God's comfort in their tragedies in war, but they're seeing God active, helping helping even in battle. They're, they're seeing God, Christians, just like you and I, are seeing God defend them and help them. And God is being glorified in that. And so I remind you to keep praying about that. Pray, you know, we tend to pray that, that war would end so there would be peace. And that's a good prayer. But we also need to pray that God be seen and glorified in everything. Good times and, and the very ho horrific times. So, uh, the, this morning's lesson is, uh, we're going to get into this topic about forgiveness. And if you are a Christian, then a lot of this message today is, is kind of, um, is directed straight at you because in Christ we have forgiveness. In Christ is where we find forgiveness. It's not in how good we can be or in our righteous acts, but it's in Christ. And so if you're a Christian, if you've submitted to Christ, you've repented of sin, you've confessed Jesus, you've been baptized for the remission of sins, to wash sins away, then you have received salvation in Christ. Uh, forgiveness of your sins. We're going to talk about that today. If you're not a Christian... I want you to know this message is what is, is lying ahead for you. It's, it's there. We invite you. We ask you. We beg you. Join us. Join us among God's people, those who are saved. Uh, salvation is available, and we preach that. It's available anytime, uh, incidentally, anytime, day or night, you want to give your life to Christ, call me. Call one of the elders. Call Zach, um, because we will stop everything we're doing. To help someone become a Christian. That's how they did it in uh, the New Testament, in the Bible, and that's how we will do it. And so uh, that's our message to the lost. But there's a great verse in Daniel 9.9 9 says, To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, for we have rebelled against Him. We. When we sin, every sin you've ever committed is a rebellion against God. And when you stop and think, I want, I want you to think with me how many different types of sins there are. And I'll run through a list uh, this morning, but this is not, uh, the list I have is not exhaustive, it's not complete, there are more, there are probably more than what I'll even be able to list this morning. Uh, but there are many types of sins, and there are three passages I want to quickly share that kind of run through different 
ones, different types. And so this one's 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. That's not saying someone who has done those things and is in Christ. It's saying someone who is outside of Christ, we're dead in our sins. And if we're in Christ and we live in sin, we sin willfully over and over and over, not trying to resist, uh, then we're, we're no longer in a safe state. But that's a, a quick list there in 1 Corinthians. And here's one from Galatians 5. The works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality. Uh, incidentally, sexual immorality is everything outside of the union of a husband and wife. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality. Idolatry, sorcery. Sorcery is one we don't talk about a lot, but um, black magic, the dark arts. If you've heard the, the term uh, Wiccan or, or that kind of group, this is when, when powerful things are, are talked about and happening and it's not about God and Christ, there are only two powers, and that's God and Satan. And so we have some of that taking place uh, in, the, in the category of sorcery, taking place even. Uh, I had someone come forward one time at, at the invitation song and handed me a, a ring that was a Wiccan ring, which is a part of witchcraft. Um, and, and she was surrendering to what she had been delving in. She was surrendering that to God, and rightfully so. Uh, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then one more list, 2 Timothy 3.2. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. When we read just these three lists, not all of these apply to all of us. Some of those you haven't done and have no desire to do, but some you have. And some you still have, you know, temptation um, to commit, sins to commit. But lying, have you ever told a lie? Have you ever cheated, ever cheated on a test? You ever stolen something, taken something that you didn't pay for? Maybe you fudged on your taxes or uh, some kind of you know, financial gain that you, you in, in a strict definition, you stole it. You ever disobeyed your parents? Have you ever rebelled against authority? Have you ever failed to have self-control? You were reckless with words or actions. Um, I've done all, all of those that I, that I just mentioned. Have you ever... Lusted, Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, you've committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever lusted either in person or uh, virtually through pornography? Ever dressed immodestly uh, in a way that was provocative that would tempt others to lust? Ever committed sexual immorality? Uh, ever been drunk, intoxicated with drugs, abusing them legally or illegally? Have you ever been envious or jealous? Ever been resentful about what someone did to you? Have you ever gossiped? Have you ever talked behind someone's back? Or had animosity or hatred towards someone? And by the way, the biblical word for that is enmity. Enmity. Uh, animosity or hatred towards someone. Ever taken revenge in the way of being aggressive or uh, what appeals more to me? Passive aggressive. That's still sin. Have you ever been greedy, which the Bible says is idolatry? Prideful, conceited, ever thought you were better than someone instead of 
feeling bad for them about what they're missing in their life, about what they're lacking, and praying for them? Have you ever been judgmental or self-righteous? I've caught myself uh, times on my way to church on Sunday mornings. I'm driving to church. And when you drive here, you pass people. You'll see people. You'll see people driving somewhere. You'll see people out in their yard working. You'll see some walking. Some probably didn't sleep in a house, or maybe they did the night before, but it wasn't their house. And you'll see people in all different states on Sunday morning when you're driving to church. And I've done that. And I've not really had what I would call, you know, um, really thoughts that were clear, but I've had judgmental thoughts. I've had judgmental thoughts. What are they doing? What are they thinking? Why aren't they going to church? Judging people's thoughts and motives. Have you ever been boastful or arrogant, rude or selfish? Have you ever grumbled or complained Scripture says, do everything without grumbling or complaining. You ever had an angry outburst or profanity, foul language? That's not a complete list. That's a number of things that hit some toes, didn't it? And that's not to mention sins of omission where there was something good to do and we failed to do it. We saw that we could have done good, we could have helped, but we just didn't. Those are sins of omission. If you think about your life from the, your life from the age of accountability, and that age is different for each person, but let's say it's 12 years old for you, looking back on your life from the age of, you know, that's the age where you, you understand good and evil, you understand sin against God, but let's say in your past, from the age of 12, how many sins have you committed? If you're, so the age of 12, let's say you're 42, roughly. Is there anyone 42 or close to it that's not afraid to tell me that you are 41, 43? Steve's not afraid, but he's nowhere near 42. We have someone over here. Thank you. Uh, 42 is a wonderful age, by the way. 41, 42, 43. If you don't think so, wait till you're 51. And you'll think, wow, that 41 was pretty good. 42, those were the days. So if you're 42, that's 30 years, give or take, that you've been sinning against God. Uh, and how many of those were you trying not to sin? We don't know, but I'll give you a super conservative number and that is a number of 10 a day, 10 sins. If you send only 10 times a day, which we don't really think, you probably don't think or may not think you send more than 10 a day, but you stop and think every act that was selfish, every thought that was selfish, every impulse uh, that you followed up on that was contrary to what God would want. Uh, sometimes in an argument, you could, you could rack up a number of sins in a single argument, not to mention the day. But let's just be very, very conservative in this number and say it was only 10. Over 30 years, that's roughly 110,000 sins that you've committed against God. I'm older than 42, so my number's higher than that, and I'm, I'm confident that I have fallen short more than 10 times a day, even trying not to and knowing better. And Romans 6.23 says... The wages of sin is death. It doesn't say that if you've committed over a thousand sins, that would lead to death. One sin. One sin carries the penalty of eternal death. And that may not make sense to us, but God planned a way to pay for those sins before He ever made us, before He ever created us. God, pay, God created a way, planned a way. It's Jesus Christ on the cross that God would pay for our sins and what we owed. But Psalm 130 you, O Lord, if you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. When Jesus was uh, beaten, when he was tortured, when he was whipped, when he was crucified, our sins were there. Every sin, you know, we estimated a, a small number of ten 
110,000. Every sin you've ever committed, Jesus suffered for. And Isaiah talks about it in Isaiah, Isaiah 53, 5. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. That's saying in about three different ways that he took on what was supposed to be for us. He took our punishment. He paid for it, every one. There was a mountain of debt that we owed, that you owed, that I owed, and Jesus paid it. Isn't that something? And God, in that just and right way, was able to forgive our sins. If you're in Christ, God has forgiven it. So, to answer the question, how much has God forgiven you? That's hard to answer. It's hard to put into words how much God has forgiven us. And I hope you feel gratitude. I'm, you know, this lesson, I'm not, my goal is not to make you feel bad about how much you've fallen short, but for you to feel grateful for how much you've been forgiven. Well, Jesus in Matthew 18 tells a story, tells a parable about a king and two different servants. And in verse 23 says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, in reading this story, when I read 10,000 talents, that sounds, it kind of sounds like a, that's a pretty big debt, but I don't really know what a talent is worth. And in the first century, a talent was not a, a type of uh, coinage but it was a weight, and so it was a measure of weight of, let's say, gold. How many, we would say how many ounces uh, or how many pounds, and they, their measure was talents. And so the question about how much was this, how much money did this servant owe in this story, the question would be, is Jesus talking about a gold talent or is he talking about silver talents? And gold would be more. Um, if it's referring to Hebrew, a Hebrew talent of gold, for frame of reference, now this is 10,000, but it only took 8,000 gold talents to build Solomon's temple. You think of what, that, what all went into the temple that Solomon built, all the gold and just the, the expense of it, that was 8,000. If Jesus is talking about silver talents, scholars estimate this to be well over a million dollars, some say 15 million in today's money would be what this servant owes in this story. If a gold talents are meant, scholars say this would be a uh, billion dollars plus, several billion. In fact, first century historian Josephus wrote about the annual, he wrote that the annual collected taxes for the entire region of Galilee and Perea under Herod was only 200 talents of gold. And it is said that 10,000 talents of gold may have been more than all the coinage that was in circulation in Egypt at the time. 10,000 gold talents is an enormous amount. Silver, 10,000 silver, is also an enormous amount. If you owed someone, let's say you're a common laborer today, you make minimum wage, which is this scenario, this story, and you owed over a million dollars as a minimum wage worker, how many lifetimes would it take for you to pay that? And the point is the same regardless this debt is massive. It's truly unpayable. Verse 25, Since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. And in this story, that's you and I. Um... The story makes a point that is very, uh, very applicable. It, it applies directly, and parts of this story don't apply. In other words, God just didn't take pity on us and release it, but Jesus paid it. But the point of the story that applies is you and I have been forgiven a mountain of debt, a mountain that we could not have paid. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished on us, lavished upon us in all wisdom 
and insight. And then I love this uh, verse from Psalm 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. That one's helpful sometimes when you're looking at your past sin and you can't accept that God has forgiven you. This, this verse is very helpful with that. Remember it, learn it, quote it to yourself. When God forgives, he moves it as far as the east is from the west. And that's how we are forgiven. But look at the story that Jesus tells. When the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So this servant who's been forgiven this mountain of debt, he could not possibly pay. He goes out and finds someone who owes him a hundred denarii. And which, so again, we don't know how, you know, that doesn't mean anything to you. How much money is that? Uh, scholars say this would have been about four months wages. So a few thousand dollars, a few thousand compared to a million. What does that look like? A few thousand compared to a billion. So... Let me uh, share just, let's kind of get an idea of how, how much, you know, these two things mean compared to each other. So this is what 100 dots, and, and as I talk about dots, each one would, for us, represent dollars. So here's what 100 dots looks like, and here's 1,000 dots. This is 2,500 dots. Incidentally, that's, this is the number of stars that you, on a typical cleared night that you could visibly see with the naked eye, 2,500. And that's what 2,500 dots looks like. Looks like. So what does a million dots look like? So if you, if you take 2,500 and, and on one page I have 2,500, how many pages do I need to get to a million? At 2,500. Some of you math people might have an idea. How many do I need? Lots? Keep going here. How many pages? $2,500 a page. Might a million yet? Imagine, it's hard to imagine a $2,500 bill. Isn't it? But each one of these... Here's you a stack, $2,500 bills. Am I at a million yet? All right, I'll skip ahead. It's 400 pages. 400 pages. Here's your million. This is one million. Now, scholars say uh, 10,000 talents in silver would likely be several million. Maybe one scholar said 15 million for the silver. This is not the gold. This is silver talents. This is your stack of a mil representing a million dollars that's been forgiven. If Jesus is talking about gold talents, which in our scenario, how much have we been forgiven? It's an amount we could not ever pay in a million lifetimes. There's not a number. But just to get an idea of... of, of even a greater frame of reference on our debt. What would a billion, if it's a billion, if it was gold talents, what does that look like? How high would this stack have to be? To make a billion talents. Have you ever seen uh, this guy at the fairgrounds? This guy is 75 feet tall. A billion dots, literally, at 2,500 a page, a billion is 125 feet. It's 50 feet taller than that statue. That's what a billion dots looks like. So let's read on. His fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow... Servants saw what had taken place. They were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I want to stop for just a moment. You wicked servant. 
right? So this servant that's been forgiven, we're not sure. Is it this? Is it, is it a million plus? Was that his debt? Or a billion plus? It's a lot. And he was forgiven that much. And he goes out and finds his fellow servant who owed him the equivalent of two pages. And he chokes him. And he has him arrested until he can pay him. And the king says, you wicked servant. Was he wicked? Do you agree with that assessment? You wicked servant, look how much you were just forgiven and then you couldn't have mercy on one who owed you a slight fraction? And then Jesus finishes the story, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. When we talk about forgiveness, it's easy thinking about how much God has forgiven us. What I mean is it's, it, I like to think about that, don't you? I like forgiveness when it applies to me. Now, the next topic is forgiving those who've trespassed against us. Do you have anyone that has sinned against you, that has hurt you, taken advantage of you, mistreated you, that you resent them for it, you're bitter toward them for it, you're angry toward them, maybe you have enmity, right? You have anger toward them about it. You want them to suffer. And that's a very human reaction, but it's not a very godly one. And God is telling us, not only does God say for us to forgive those who trespass against us, but God says when you forgive someone, your chief motivation is that mountain of debt, the mountain of debt that God has forgiven us. Can, can, I, can I forgive someone who owes me this much? compared to what I've been forgiven? Can I forgive someone? And I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier when we remember how much we've been forgiven. And I remind you, if we hold in our heart that resentment and we don't work on letting it go, if we hang on to that, we are that wicked servant. That's what we are. Next Sunday sermon will be about how do I forgive when it's, when it's really difficult to forgive. How do I do that? What's involved in that? We'll talk about that next Sunday. We're going to sing a song of encouragement this morning. You may be here and you've never, you're not a Christian. You're not in Christ. All those sins that we talked about in your past, you're car those are on you. You're carrying those around. They are, they are against your record in God's eyes. But God is offering you to pay your debt. And he offers that if we respond in faith and confession and baptism. And we would love to help you with that now, this afternoon, anytime. But why put it off? If you're, if you're not a Christian, let us help you become one. If you need prayers this morning or something else, please come and let us know while we stand and sing. Come to Jesus, he will save you, though your sins have ransomed Lord. If you give your heart to Jesus, he will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to
Jesus. Come on.